Hey everybody, Pastor Chad here to talk your questions from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 7 to 16. Uh, we got five questions in this week, so I don't know if that's more of you that are watching these videos or if just one of you is getting really curious and sends in multiple forms. Um, but looking forward to talking about these questions with you today. We got some great stuff. Let's dive right in. Question number one says this. In the Old Testament, Moses' natural talent was not in the area of public speaking, or so he felt. Uh, which is funny if you know the story. Um, Aaron's natural talent, at least from Moses' point of view, was in public speaking. With this in mind, to what extent does the Bible speak to how natural genetic talent or abilities can determine my spiritual gifts? Um, that's a good question, because I did make the claim on Sunday that sometimes a spiritual gift is something new you receive at the time of conversion. It's something you weren't good at before, and then, pa, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit just gives it to you. Um, in other cases, I said on Sunday um, that a spiritual gift can look like the Holy Spirit taking something that the question asker calls a natural or genetic talent and pointing it at Jesus to its proper end. I, I said both of these would be under the umbrella of spiritual gifts. And so the question is, where does the Bible say that? Um, one place I would point you to is Romans chapter 12, verse 6. Um, there it's a very similar passage to Ephesians chapter 4, and what Paul says there is, um, therefore, having different gifts um, according to the grace that's been entrusted to each and every one of us, uh, let us use them. And then he goes on to talk about a list of spiritual gifts there. Uh, and if you look at the list there, you'll find things like zeal. Um, I know plenty of non-Christians who are just naturally um, zealous and energetic. Um, he's going to talk about leadership. I know plenty of non-Christians that just have a natural leadership gifting. And yet, um, when God saves us, he takes these natural things and he points them at Jesus. And what Paul says is, if you have these gifts, um, some of them are supernatural, like healing, like that's not something you would have had before. Um, but some of them, like I said, look like natural talent or ability. And he says, if you have these gifts, then use them. So to what degree does the Bible say my natural talent would um, speak to my spiritual gifts? I think what the Bible would say is if you've got a gift, if you've got a talent, and you've got the Holy Spirit in you, then you use that gift by the power of the Holy Spirit to make much of Jesus. Now, in the question of Moses, um, the question asker does say something very perceptive here. He does not seem to be a very good public speaker. He literally says, like, I, I, I'm slow of speech. I'm not good at speech. I stutter. Could we have my brother? He's real good at speech. Come in here. And so um, when you read the whole of Scripture, you will see sometimes God does call you um, to a particular calling that's outside of your skill set. Um, Paul will say something similar about himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He'll say, hey, I'm not the most eloquent speaker but God sent me to you to preach the gospel so that you would know the power of the gospel is found in the content of the message, not in the polish of the speaker. And so sometimes God will call us to a calling um, that our natural gifts doesn't look like a good fit for. And he'll do that to show off his power to work through weak vessels like us. And so there are unique callings like that in the Bible. Um, and I would say any good ministry shows that the power comes from God and not from us. But in general, I think our marching orders from Romans 12, 6 would be pretty clear that if you've got a talent, if you've got a gift, then use it for Jesus. And if God calls you to something that you go, my gifting doesn't line up, but God clearly calls, he's speaking through his word, he's speaking through his people, the Holy Spirit is leading you and confirming that call, well, then you better follow that call because Moses being hesitant to follow God's call there really missed out on some cool stuff in his life and God used him well in the end anyway, because that's a gracious God we serve. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Romans 12, 6 would be a great spot to look for. Um, if you've got a gift, if it is a natural talent, then you use it for Jesus. And we see tons of great examples of that in the Bible. And so um, that, that would be how I would answer question number one. Here, let's go. Question number two, kind of along the same lines. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11 speaks to the divine distribution of spiritual gifts that seems to suggest a one gift to one person correlation. However, earlier in the chapter and in Ephesians 4.4, 4, Paul emphasizes that we have the same one spirit. That would be the Holy Spirit. Um, in what ways does the Bible address how we can have full and complete access to the same one spirit if each one of us has been gifted only partially 
one gift versus all. So again, this would go back to what I said about the last one, that I think a lot of times what a spiritual gift is the Holy Spirit coming upon you and taking the natural talent that even as we say natural talent, we have to have a good theology of creation. Um, our natural talents aren't something that um, happen by nature. That's something that God wired in us in our mother's womb, um, and he gave us. So um, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he takes a gift that God made in us at creation, was pointed in all the wrong ways, and then he points it on Jesus. I think that's why you see a diversity of gifts. So when um, God made you, he wired you with certain giftings and abilities. And apart from Christ, you weren't able to use it to its fullest end. But then when you are saved and sealed with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit points it at its proper end. And God made me and he gave me certain gifts and my gifts are different than yours. And so when the Holy Spirit fills me, it's the same spirit, but he's filling a different vessel. And that's, I think, why the gifts look so different. Um, and so um, it's, it's not that the Holy Spirit is schizophrenic and has different gifts on Tuesday than he does on Wednesday or has different gifts for you or for me, but it's that the Holy Spirit breathes life into the being that is you and me that God created. And what comes out of that just looks different from you and me because you and me, we are different, but it's the same Spirit of God that empowers us to live for the purpose that God wired us for when he made us. And so when the Holy Spirit fills different personalities and different giftings, as he fills us to point at Jesus with those things, the fullness of all those diverse giftings together gives a better and fuller picture of what our God is like. So that's why it's a good thing that there's a lot of different giftings. So hope help that hope, hope that helps understand how we can all have the same Holy Spirit and different gifts. Um, at the end of the day, it's the same spirit who fills us, but he's filling different vessels. And as he fills all of these different vessels, the full image of God is seen in the church across all of our beautiful diversity. Okay, question number three says, in Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 13, Paul lists the gifts that he, Jesus, gave, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints and the building up of the body of Christ. Does this mean a literal giving from Jesus to the disciples before his ascension, or is it his spirit that infuses believers with these gifts even today? Okay, so this is a great question because this question asker was really paying attention when we were talking about that quote from Psalm 68 in Ephesians chapter 4 that talked about Jesus descending to the lower parts of the earth to take our sin to the grave to defeat Satan, sin, and death. And on the third day, when he rose from the grave and is, Paul says, ascends on high, he not only defeats Satan, sin, and death, forgiving all of our sin, past, present, and future, but he also gives gifts to his people. And so the question asker is saying, is that literally speaking about the moment Jesus walked out of the tomb, saw the 11 disciples, breathed on them, said, receive these gifts, go be my witnesses, or is this speaking more metaphorically about the age in which we live in, that now the resurrected Jesus rules and reigns from heaven from the moment he ascended back in the first century until now, and from heaven he gives to every believer through the power of his Holy Spirit gifts in every age. Um, and if you just had Ephesians 4, uh, you could really, I think, read it either way. Um, Ephesians 4 doesn't clarify. Is this talking literally at the moment of Jesus' resurrection, limited to the 11 disciples there? Or is this speaking more metaphorically of the age we live in and how Jesus rules and reigns from heaven during this age? If you just had Ephesians 4, I think you'd have to say you could go either way. But we don't just have Ephesians 4. We have the entire Bible. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think, speaks very directly to this question. Um, this is another one of those chapters, like Romans chapter 12, that's speaking about spiritual gifts. And listen to what Paul says in verse 7. He says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So this is written to the church in Corinth, not to the 11 disciples. This church was uh, far away from Jerusalem when Jesus walked out of the tomb. So these are not people who were present at that exact moment. And Paul says to them, each member of this church in Corinth has been given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And if you keep reading, that's spiritual gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit of God. 
And so um, I think that passage, as well as many others in scriptures, would lead me to see Ephesians chapter 4 as speaking um, really more metaphorically of the age we live in, that Jesus really died in our place for our sins, took it to the grave, really rose from the dead on the third day. And now we live in this age of Jesus's resurrection, where the resurrected Jesus rules and reigns from heaven as the risen Lord. And from his throne in heaven, he continues to give gifts to each and every one of his people through the power of his Holy Spirit, just like he gave to his 11 original disciples, just like he gave to every member of the church in Corinth, he gives to you and me who believe in him today. The ruling and reigning Jesus from heaven continues to give to us through the power of his Holy Spirit. That's the testimony of scripture until he returns to make all things new. So that's the day and age we live in. It's an exciting day to live in. And like Paul said in Romans chapter 12, if we've been given gifts um, and the Holy Spirit's empowered them for their proper end, then let's use them for the glory of Christ to grow the church until he should return and make all things new. Okay, number four says this, are these gifts gender specific? Most evangelical churches do not allow women to be pastors, but here in these verses, if no gender is identified with the gifting, then couldn't a woman be endowed with the gift of pastorship? Um, I don't see anything in this text or in the New Testament more broadly that would indicate that spiritual gifting is in any way gender-based. I don't think the Holy Spirit gives some gifts to men and some gifts to women. I just don't see evidence of that in the scripture. And rather, what I see in... Um, let me give you a few examples where you see women that have gifting that you would often see in a pastor or elder. Listen to this. Um, Acts 21 verse 9 talks about three daughters. I believe it's three daughters of Philip in that text who prophesied. So they, they prophesied, which is a gift. Prophecy is a gift. You'll see in 1 Corinthians 11 5, Paul talks about women prophesying. Um, and then in Titus 2 verses 3 to 5, Paul will talk about women teaching. So I don't think there's anything in the scriptures that would lead me to believe that spiritual gifts are limited to men or women. I think the Holy Spirit freely gives gifts to all. And like we talked about, really kind of uh, fills the unique individual and fulfills um, the good works that Christ has laid out for them to do, Ephesians 2.10, and gives them all the gifts needed for the good works God has laid out for them to do. Now, that said, the way I understand the scriptures is that God has designed men and women not to be totally interchangeable, but has designed men and women in a complementary way. Um, and so I do see evidence in the scriptures that the Bible would call biblically qualified men to the role of pastor elder. Now, based on what I just said, I hope you can see that's not because men are smarter or more gifted, but rather it's a reflection of God's complementary design that's meant to bring more beauty to the church and reflect more of his glory in the church and in the world. So um, who gets to be in what offices? It's not a matter of value, dignity, worth, ability. It's really a matter of how Christ has decided to order the church. And how do we get there? That's another question for another time. But the way I would sum this up is I don't see gifts as being limited based on gender, but I do see God having a specific design for offices. And so if you were a woman that would say, man, I think I have the gift of teaching. I, I think I have the gift of prophecy. Like I have a heart that it sounds like what you said about a pastor on Sunday, where I really care for people. I want to make sure people are well tended to and cared for. I'd say, praise God for that gift. I, who am I to say God didn't give you that gift? I, as one of your pastors, would want to see you equipped to use your gifts in the fullness for which God gave it to you. And one of the ways that we would do that is to do it according to the operation that is laid out in the scriptures for the different offices in the church. And so I hope it doesn't sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth to you. Um, I believe that God freely gives of gifts to all, and I believe that he has a complementary design for the offices in the church that richly enhance both men and women for the glory of God. And so if you are a woman who feels like you have a teaching gift or a prophetic gift, um, I want to affirm that in you and really want to help cultivate that in you just like I would any man in this church. And so um, if that's something you want to grow in, contact the office. Like we're always looking for more teachers and more leaders in the church. And so hopefully that gets at your question. And if you want to know more about the big issue of why, why do I kind of land where I land on um, the roles of men and women, we could totally talk about that in another sermon question video, but that'd have to take the whole question video. Uh, for now, let me land the plane with question number five. Historically at Fair Oaks, 
Previous pastors have all shared a hopeful vision for small groups as a foundation for the growth of our church. However, implementing the reality of vision of small groups has been varied. What is the same or different about how you see scripture guiding your plan to implement small groups at Fair Oaks? So um, I haven't had an opportunity to meet any of the prior pastors of Fair Oaks, so I can't say for certain what would be different about my vision. Um, but there are two things I could tell you about why I am so passionate about small groups. Um, the first reason um, is biblically, so many of the one another's we see in scripture just can't be done in a room of 200 people. It's got to be done more individually. So I think biblically, you see this idea that life on life community is a necessary part of what the church is. You heard me say a lot on that Sunday. Um, let me share one spot in scripture I think is really instructive. It seems like um, oftentimes in the church, what we do is we either prioritize having a really great Sunday gathering or we prioritize having great small groups. And it's kind of like a sucker's choice, like one or the other. But my understanding biblically is the church needs strong, large gatherings and strong, smaller communities where you can do life on life. And Acts 2.46 is one place you see this, where the new church, it's bursting forth, it's growing. It's like a beautiful picture of the church in Acts 2 there at the end. And one of the things you see about them is that they meet in the temple. So that's lots of people and they meet in homes breaking bread together. So that's a small group of people. So uh, one of the first reasons I would talk about, you know, you ask about what do I see in scripture? I see in scripture that we are mandated to do things that can only be done in life on life. And I see that both a big Sunday gathering that focuses on the preaching of the word and the responding with singing in such a way that would warm our hearts to follow Jesus all week long is absolutely necessary. And at the same time, small groups where we can apply that scripture, work it out in life on life is necessary. And so um, for me, it's not a sucker's choice, Sunday or small groups. And I think sometimes for pastors it is. For me, um, one enhances the other, the other enhances that. And so um, because you know me well enough to know I'm passionate about the preaching of God's word for the building up of God's people, then you've got to know I see small groups as necessary for the application of that word. And so for me, it is just deeply a biblical value that we need both. And so that's one thing that's driving me. The second thing I'll tell you is my own experience. Karen and I have led small groups for as long as we've known each other together, um, had the honor of leading a small group ministry in a church together. Um, and I've just seen through my experience why the Bible says what it does. Like my experience has just taught me that when you are doing life on life with people, that growth happens in a way that it doesn't, even under the best Bible preaching, isolated, not in a small group. And so my own experience is some of what's fueling me to say, we've got to do small groups that like we're in a pandemic time. This is not easy to do small groups. We're looking at doing online and in-person and finding kind of different risk levels you feel comfortable with and tiering all of our groups. Like it is complicated to do small groups, but we are looking at doing them when the holidays are over and launching a number of new groups. Because for me, it's a biblical value. And from my own experience, I've seen I would not be the Christian I am today without these groups. And to continue to walk with Christ, I need a small group in my life. And so if nothing else, maybe you could just trust I'm in my own self-interest of I know from personal experience, I need these groups with life on life. And so um, I'm going to be firing this up, um, if not for you, for my own soul. And so hopefully that gives you an idea of just how deep this beats in me from both a biblical and experiential standpoint. Um, I know application and actually doing it is going to be hard in a pandemic. That's why we're asking that you'd fill out that form, that info form about groups so we can get as much info as possible to do the best we can. And so all of that said, I'd encourage you to fill out that form. And I just ask you to be gracious and patient with us as we try to figure out how to open small groups during this crazy season we're in. If it's been hard in the past to get small groups ministries up at Fair Oaks, and I'll just say that's not unique to Fair Oaks. Uh, it is difficult in general, um, but it is a difficulty worth tackling because what happens when we live life on life like this, centered on the gospel, the people of God and the word of God come together in such a way that the spirit of God lights on fire for our own good, for the good of one another, and for the good of our communities. I think that is at the heart of a healthy church, along with the Sunday gathering that makes much of Jesus. So hopefully you hear how deep it beats in me and can... Um, 
know what a value it is to me and hopefully you'll be patient with us as we try to figure it out. Um, and if you're someone that'd be interested in leading one of those groups, I'd also ask you to fill out those form. If that's your leadership gifting, want to equip you to do that so that we can open up groups for everyone to discover and to use their gifting. So thank you for tuning in for this video, hanging in here this whole time. If you're still watching, um, looking forward to being in the rest of Ephesians 4 with you this coming Sunday. See you then.